You are listening to From Embers, a weekly show on CFRC 101.9 FM about anarchist and anti-authoritarian ideas and practice. We are broadcasting from the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples on land that has come to be called Kingston, Ontario, Canada because of the thievery and brutality of the Canadian state and its empire-loving parents. From Embers is about fires, some real and some metaphorical. Fires started generations ago and tended to over the years. Little sparks all across this territory that we hope will grow, spread, and engulf the thieving state called Canada and the capitalist system that has plagued this land since the fur trade. As many of you know, May 1st is marked by anti-capitalists and anti-authoritarians around the world as part of International Workers' Day or May Day. Here in Ontario, some demonstrations this year were themed around building resistance to the right-wing Ford government, whose austerity measures are bringing deep funding cuts to public services across the province. At a rally at Queen's Park in Toronto, According to one report back, anarchists and radicals decided to make things a bit more confrontational by bringing a homemade replica guillotine, dripping with fake blood with the words, cuts are political violence written on the side. The reaction, at least in politics and in the mainstream media, looked like this. Of all the anti-Ford protests outside the Ontario legislature, none has been like this. On Wednesday afternoon, amid another demonstration, a handful of protesters brought a homemade guillotine to Queen's Park. It was smeared with fake blood, with one protester holding up a sign saying, chop, chop. It was disrespectful, uh, it was cruel, and it's a credible threat that has been referred to the Ontario Provincial Police. The situation in Toronto got me thinking about the image of the guillotine and other symbolic gestures towards political violence. I've certainly noticed a rise of guillotine memes in the last couple years, and I wondered why that is. Then I came across an article called Against the Logic of the Guillotine, posted to the Crime Think website, which placed the guillotine in its historical context and engaged in an in-depth discussion about revenge fantasies, political violence, and imagining liberatory revolutionary alternatives. The piece is at once challenging, hopeful, and controversial all qualities that I thought would make for a good discussion for this podcast. So tonight I'm going to be speaking with one of the authors from Crime Think, which is a decentralized anarchist collective and publishing project that's been around since the mid-1990s. We discuss the ideas in the article and tease out some of the philosophical tensions that underpin it. To be clear, my goal with this piece is not to call out or shame the guillotine crew in Toronto, as the media and the so-called progressives have been doing now for weeks. In fact, I applaud their courage and creative experimentation and want to be clear that this is not the same old pacifist condemnation of violence. Instead, I hope to encourage some constructive, critical reflection on the images that we project of a freer world and the consequences that they have. For the purposes of this conversation, I'm just one of many participants in Crime Think Projects. Uh, I'd like to be understood in the way that Alfredo Bonanno described himself as a comrade among comrades. Um, So would you like to start just by talking a bit about why uh, folks set out to write this piece? Like, what was the impetus for writing it? Hmm. Well, the, the article was written just because guillotine memes have become so common over the last few years. 
And also in response to, you know, the, the most widely known vehicle for the radical left in the U.S. now is called Jacobin. So there's this, these references to this history that very few people are familiar with. And this is taking place in a context of escalating social and political polarization in the United States, um, increasing conflicts. People on at all points on the political spectrum are angry and disempowered. And from our vantage point as longtime anarchists, we see people on the left as well as on the right who seem to be fantasizing about uh, authoritarian institutions solving their problems for them. You know, that if only they could, uh, they could see revenge executed on their behalf, and which is something that we've seen from the right wing for a long time, but it's, it's disturbing for me to see this from, from the left. And uh, I really like how you sort of discuss this issue in the context of the history of the guillotine and specifically um, going through sort of the French Revolution references that a lot of people make and contrasting it with the burning of the guillotine in the Paris Commune. Um, Would you like to just give a bit of that story for our listeners? Well, the original French Revolution began famously with the storming of the Bastille, which was a military base but was also a prison. Uh, And so, yeah, the liberating phase of the French Revolution began with the storming of a prison. And you could argue that the liberating phase of the French Revolution ended when uh, the Jacobins began to use the guillotine to solve their problems and, you know, killed off, as often happens in revolutions they killed off the most radical elements first and then they you know they killed off the uh the more moderate people who were competing with them for control of the revolution this this long standing premise that a revolution will succeed if a single authoritarian body is able to gain like a stabilized control at the at the heart of things and and it exercise coercive force over over the entire nation. And this is, this is obviously not an anarchist idea. This is an authoritarian idea. Now, it was interesting for us, looking at what happened in France, first, that it didn't work to keep uh, the Jacobins, to keep the, the people who were supposedly trying to make the French Revolution succeed in power, you know, because as soon as they had guillotined all of their potential allies, it was easy for the reactionary forces to to guillotine them, to gain control of France. This is how ultimately Napoleon Bonaparte came to power and the French Revolution shifted into this sort of nationalist quest for empire that brought to an end the, the hopes of that generation for revolution. But it was also interesting to us studying uh, the French Revolution of 1870 and 1871, when the Paris Commune took place, that one of the first things that participants in the Paris Commune did, like grassroots uh, working people in the Paris Commune did, was that they went to the place in Paris where the guillotine was kept, and they brought it out, and they didn't start guillotining rich people with it. They didn't, you know, start guillotining tyrants. They, uh, they took it, and they burned it. And for us, this, this speaks to us across the, the centuries as a, as a brave and courageous refusal to affirm coercive force, you know, like lethal coercive force as, as a tool that can play a desirable role in, in social change. Now, I want to be clear, I'm not coming to this from the perspective of pacifism, uh, this is an important conversation topic to, for us because we believe that, yes, we have to employ coercive force in the course of social change. Otherwise, you have no way to defend yourself. But the, it's a, really, it's a question about what we fantasize about, what we imagine is, is going to create the kind of society that we want to live in, and, and what we understand ourselves as desiring, you know, and desiring to, to shed oceans of blood now, many of us, understandably, you know, you're in conflict with your boss, you're in conflict with your landlord, you, you, Donald Trump is president, all these terrible things are happening. It's understandable that people would want to shed blood. But the point that we're arguing here is that we can't understand the shedding of blood as being our political 
like project or our political goal. To go back to the difference between the French Revolution and the Paris Commune for a second, if you just want to take a class perspective, you know, the, the traditional class reductionist or Marxist take is that the original French Revolution was a bourgeois revolution that, that brought like property owners and, uh, and instituted a sort of a bourgeois democracy. Uh, it's not unusual that a bourgeois uh, democracy would still be using coercive force at, you know, as a fundamental like, part of, of their political program, that they would centralize it in the hands of the state and, and see their, their, their goal as being to kill everyone who uh, was incompatible with their political program. But that workers in the Paris Commune, you know, people who were from the, the proletariat, you know, rank and file participants in the, in the struggle, understood that as long as there is a state controlled, you know, centralized, concentrated, state-legitimized form of, of violence, that that is always going to be used against the underdogs, against the proletariat, against the, the people on the, the receiving end of power imbalances. And so fundamentally for us, the burning of the guillotine is like a, an expression of revolutionary optimism and, and a refusal to use tools that, that can't actually lead us to the goals that we're shooting for. Right. And I, I think that that leads into uh, my next question pretty well, which is when you say the logic of the guillotine, um, can you explain what is meant by that? Well, the, the fundamental question here is, what does revolutionary social change entail? Does it mean that we kill the bad people? And, you know, or maybe if we want to be a little bit less, like, brutal, that we put them in gulags or something? Uh, so that the good people can live freely. As an anarchist, I would argue, no, that's not the way that we have to understand social change. If we regard people as static, you know, as, as fixed quantities, uh, if we reduce people to their status in this society, uh, rather than focusing on the relations between people and the potential that all human beings have you know, for change, if we take that approach, we're bound to end up utilizing some sort of guillotine logic where revolutionary social change means subtracting certain people from the world. But this, this logic doesn't distinguish us from any other authoritarian party, including the, the most despicable ones. You know, for me, the, the goal that we should have is, is to transform our relationships and to create situations in which people who currently are not able to have a positive or mutually fulfilling, mutually beneficial relationship can have such relations. And like I said, there, there will be conflict, there will be struggle, there will be violence on the way to that, but that is a totally different goal than thinking that our use of force should be, uh, should be guided by the intention to destroy our enemies. I think you make a, a, a nice point about this too when you're talking about uh, people not wanting to get their own hands dirty or not taking these things, you know, seriously enough that they are willing to engage in the kinds of violence that is implied by the guillotine themselves. And it's, it's, it's always about someone else doing it in a sort of rationalistic kind of form. Yeah, I mean, this is, this is why guillotine memes specifically are distinct from, from other kinds of revolutionary fantasies, right? I mean, the you know, Molotov cocktail imagery or the traditional, like, black bloc imagery of a, a bunch of people acting together to defend themselves from police violence. Those are tactics or tools that, that can be employed without implying the concentration of force in the hands of a bureaucracy. You know, the, the guillotine is to be used against people who are already in your power. I would argue that it's... Uh, that it's cowardly and irresponsible to, to kill someone that once that person is powerless before you, you know, and, the, and that that should not, be, should not be what we are fantasizing about. There's this whole question about tools here, right? Are tools neutral? Of course, uh, people fantasize about using the tools of the system against the system. You can look at every tool at its historical application, and we can 
uh, we can identify what happens when revolutionaries get their hands on those tools and use them. You know, this is not just uh, an abstract question. This is a concrete historical question. Some of the, the problem here is about the absence of collective memory. Some of the problem is that people who are reposting guillotine memes have not read the history of the French Revolution. You know, people who are, uh, who are fantasizing about getting their hands on their oppressors don't know what happened to people like them the last time that happened and was guided by like a party or an authoritarian organization. So the issue here is, is not about whether we can use revolutionary force or revolutionary violence. It's specifically about the, the fantasy of a well-oiled machine doing the work for us. And that, that's why there's a correlation actually between the guillotine itself, which is like a basically turns capital punishment into a spectator sport historically. It's, uh, you know, it's this ritual in which people who have already been captured are brought out in front of a bunch of other people and executed as this like spectator sport, legitimizing the, the power of the state, you know, or like confirming it. And, and the, the meme about the guillotine, because a, a meme is just that. People who are posting memes by and large are, are not the people who are in Rojava right now engaging in these like hard questions about what to do with captured ISIS fighters that are the like real lived version of this, of this question. You know, the average person who is posting a guillotine meme is posting it from the comfort of a non-revolutionary situation, knowing that they're not actually going to get their hands bloody. But the, the problem is that when we legitimize these things in, you know, in times of comparative social peace, you know, the fantasies that we promote right now will eventually, as our society gets more and more volatile and there are more and more situations of unrest, these fantasies will be, you know, the signposts to the future that, that we have to work from when we are in a revolutionary situation. So I think it's very important that we think critically now about which signposts are, are going to get us to the future we actually want to arrive at. Yeah, and and one of the ideas expressed in the article is, um, I'm actually going to read a quote that I pulled out uh, that says, if we wish to wield coercive force responsibly when there is no other choice, we should cultivate a distaste for it. Um, and I like that idea. I think it's, I agree with that idea. Um, at the same time, I think about, say, here in the context of urban Ontario in Canada, that it, it's a, it's a very, uh, pacified society overall. Uh -huh. And actually a lot of what we're doing as anarchists is trying to break through that pacification and break through that social peace, not by calling for mass murder, but for, for calling for people to get angry and to get active and fight back. Um, so I wonder if there's, yeah, if, if there's a way to balance, like, uh, cultivating that distaste for violence, but also, creating openings for people to become more active in resisting for their own survival. Absolutely. I mean, and this, this for us is a pressing and real question because we are promoting and practicing revolutionary self-defense. For me, one of the important things when we're talking about resistance, when we're talking about revolutionary self-defense, is that it's very important to match our words with deeds. Words gain their force. They gain their, their traction on our lives by our habits of, of backing them up with action. You know, If you say, this should happen, and then you do it, next time somebody says something should happen, it's thinkable that it will happen as well. This was always my critique of someone like Derek Jensen, who says every morning I get up and I try to decide whether to blow up a dam or to write a book. And of course, posing the question to himself that way, he always decided to write the book, right? Not to blow up the dam, you know? And for me, this is irresponsible. I would like to think that if I believed that personally in an individualistic act, blowing up a dam, if that was the most effective thing that I could do, that I would do it. And it would be irresponsible not to do that. If, you know, through this, like process of, of consideration, like uh, I had decided that that would be the most effective tactic. 
I think that it's important that the tactics that we employ uh, be reproducible and be tactics that we can engage in immediately. And so if we're talking about revolutionary violence, then I think it's realistic right now to, to use examples of things that people have recently done you know, and, that, and that we could participate in. I think it's dangerous to imagine that the more intense the, the, the violence or the conflict or the, the tools that people are using, the more revolutionary the situation is. You know, like people looking at what happens in Rojava and imagining that there is more social potential for liberation there because there are more guns being employed. I think this is a, a really dangerous mental shortcut that, that actually conflates revolutionary social change with the use of force. We should be focusing on developing our skills to evaluate what actually constitutes the kind of changes that we want to see. So in, in that regard, I, I actually think that guillotine memes, because they don't refer to something that we are immediately about to do, don't contribute to the likelihood that we will actually take forceful action. I think that we have to, we have to combine realistic proposals um, with like immediately following through on those. And that that will actually produce more contagious and reproducible examples of self-defense. We also have to imagine that when we enter into revolutionary conflict that we might actually win. And if we win, it will be essential that the goals that we are fighting for are desirable goals so that we don't just set up another version of the same order that exists today with a, a slightly differently distributed like uh, use of, of force to keep people in line. Memes or replica guillotines or whatever, they, they tend to be kind of gestures towards, like you said, revenge fantasies. Would you make a distinction between like guillotine ones and another one that I think of that is comes comes out a lot is the um, assassination of Mussolini after World War II. Mm -hmm. That's a very uh, common image that gets circulated as a kind of like revenge fantasy. Do you think there's any difference there? That's a good question. I'd have to do more research about what happened to Mussolini. It's hard not to think of Mussolini, like I was saying before, as a static quantity, as somebody who should just be removed from the world, you know? The goal of fascists is to teach us that, it, that there are people who should be removed from the world. And if we accept their premises, even if our conclusion is just that they should be removed from the world, this is a very different thing from uh, expressing like a revolutionary optimism, you know? I, it's in the article, but... Um, the, the counter argument would be that the worst thing that could happen to a Mussolini would be for him to have to spend the rest of his life in an anarchist society in which everyone knew what he had done and despised him for it. You know, and he would be he would have to show up to the, you know, the village assembly and nobody would listen to him speak. Nobody would respect him, you know, but but that he would actually be uh, be powerless to harm other people. You know, that we wouldn't need to kill him. And I think this is a, this is a more honorable fantasy. And it's a revenge fantasy, honestly. But it's a more honorable revenge fantasy. Uh, because it's, it's different from, from a state proposal. For me, the, the more different point of reference would be the assassination of King Umberto of Italy. By, uh, by Bresci, the anarchist who had also rescued Malatesta from an assassin. You know, there's a gunman trying to kill Malatesta and Bresci was unarmed, threw himself on the gunman, uh, disarmed him, saved Malatesta's life. And then a couple years later, you know, like took all of his money and bought like a, bought a, a handgun and a ticket across the Atlantic. And it, at great personal risk to himself, assassinated the Italian king who had overseen the, the murder of more than a thousand working people in this like conflict in Italy shortly before then. For me, again, this is a more honorable fantasy. You know, this is a, for, for us to like imagine is because 
it's not about getting someone in your power. It's not about being the, the dominant force and killing the underdog. It's about an underdog standing up to a much more powerful force and, you know, at, at great risk, at great personal sacrifice, like uh, making a gesture that, that points to the, the possibility that all of us could rise up against our oppressors. And I'm not saying that individualistic assassinations are the, the tactic that we should be employing. And there's some criticism, some legitimate criticism about whether they played the role that uh, partisans of propaganda of the deed hoped that they would play in revolutionary social change a century ago. But if I have to choose between a guillotine meme and remembering the, the courageous acts of underdogs, of, of course I'm always going to want to do the latter. I sort of understood when I first saw this article, I understood it in uh, almost as part of a series of things that have come out of the crime think publishing world um, that have been critical towards certain ways that the Russian Revolution is is remembered and critical of uh, Bolshevism and this kind of thing. So is there sort of a current effort within that project to distinguish anarchists from authoritarian communism and why, if so? Hmm. Well, yeah, I, I think that the prospects for for revolutionary struggle, if not actually for successful revolution, are much, much more promising now than they were 20 years ago. I think there are a lot of people who are interested in what social change would mean and, and who recognize that it's essential, who recognize that our species is probably going to go extinct uh, by any number of different like threat models if we don't bring about serious like, transformation of our society. And so it's a very important time to, to talk about revolution and the different things that it can mean. I don't think any of us like, have a personal hostility towards people who are currently in authoritarian socialist or communist parties or you know, who identify with Stalinism or Leninism. But we definitely think that the anarchist proposal is something different. You know, for, for the sake of everyone who participated in the, the Russian Revolution of 1917 to 1921, you know, including Bolsheviks who were executed for having brought about all the positive social changes that happened then, I think it's, it's essential that we remember that that happened, that we understand why it happened, and that we make sure that when we bring about the changes, the up, up, you know, uprisings and ruptures and upheavals that are ahead of us, that, that we go into it armed with a, like a really thorough knowledge of what happened last time people engaged in social revolutions like this and, and how we are going to make sure that they have different consequences. Entra la corte, esamina il caserio, e gli domanda se si era pentito. Cinque minuti m'avessero dato un altro presidente avrei ammazzato. Lo conoscete voi questo pugnale? Sì, lo conosco, c'ha il manico arrotondo nel cuore di Carnò, l'ho penetrato a fondo. Li conoscete voi, i vostri compagni? Io son dell'anarchia, casario fa il fornaio e non la spia. You just heard the interrogation of Sante Casario, 
an Italian anarchist who in 1894 fatally stabbed Marie-Francois Sadi Carnot, president of the French Third Republic. For his crime, Sante was executed at the guillotine. You're listening to From Embers, a weekly radio show and podcast of anarchist ideas and practice. Tonight, I'm speaking with a member of Crime Think who co-authored Against the Logic of the Guillotine. In this next segment, you're going to hear us refer a little bit to the SHAC campaign, which stands for Stop Huntington Animal Cruelty, which was an international campaign to put pressure on Huntington Life Sciences to stop animal testing. A notable feature of the SHAC campaign were tactics that targeted executives personally at their homes. For more information, you can see the Shack model, which was an article published by Crime Think back in 2008 and is still available online. Yeah, one thing I think about in the context of this debate is some of the um, debates in uh, Europe that I have read a little bit of in terms of uh, back and forth debates about armed struggle groups. And this question uh, you brought up earlier in terms of um, things being reproducible and trying to avoid... Uh, specialists of revolution and this kind of thing is this uh, is this an important priority for you? Well, yeah, it's it's the fundamental question, you know, because I mean, this this gets at the question of what the distinction is between revolutionary social change in an anti-authoritarian sense and 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 mere like military conflict. We aren't participants in a party that we hope to bring to power. We don't hope to, to rule others or to determine the shape of all social life. We hope to make it impossible for anyone to do that. That's a fundamental distinction. And so when we think about revolutionary tactics, we should be thinking about which tactics will enable everyone to defend themselves against uh, attempts to impose coercive order. Uh, we should be thinking about which uh, strategies we can use that will be reproducible, that can be infectious, that can be contagious, which forms of social change we can engage in that others will see these changes and want to carry them out themselves rather than understanding what we're doing as engaging in a, a partisan struggle of group A versus group B. You know, the, the, the thing that distinguishes revolution from war, in, in my opinion, is that it's transformative and contagious. You know, that's, that's actually the reason that, the, for example, the Russian Revolution was able to succeed was because of the, the solidarity coming from restless, opp oppressed people in other parts of the world. The, you know, the dock workers' strikes in Western Europe that prevented uh, Western European countries from intervening. All, all of these different factors that m threatened uh, that this revolution would, would spread. The, the thing that makes it possible for us to win when we're I in a revolutionary struggle is if our desires, our ethics, our, our like forms of liberation are so compelling that others can see themselves in what we're doing and undertake their own like version of it, or if others who've already been involved in struggles, maybe much longer than, than we as anarchists have been, can r recognize uh, the possibilities in, in a shared struggle. This is the thing that offers us like the opportunity for a, a victory that would be thoroughgoing and transformative rather than just another party coming to power and trying to enforce its particular agenda on everyone. Yeah, and I was really struck when I first read the article about how the word everyone is used in terms of uh, anarchism is a proposal for everyone. Uh, and there's a quote in there that says, hope is our most precious resource. And I think it is a very optimistic perspective in terms of the idea that our relations, including with potentially some people who are oppressors, uh, can be transformed. Yeah, and, and I think a lot of what uh, those of us in the radical left do when we create propaganda or messaging is is we're encouraging and inciting people to turn against their bosses, turn against their landlords, turn against their rapists, turn against the Nazis. 
Um, but I think that there's a different kind of analysis of identity and social roles implied yeah. in, in what you're writing about. Um, totally. Would you be able to unpack that a little bit for us? The easiest way to come at this is to use a conceptual tool that I know from German anti-fascists, which is this, this idea of structural anti-Semitism. I have a lot of problems with the like, anti-Deutsch critique, but I think this particular tool can serve us here. The idea of structural anti-Semitism is that when you personify the social structures or institutions that you oppose as the particular beneficiaries of them or the particular people who enforce them, that you are basically doing what anti-Semites have done, you know, with, with the banking institutions, for example, by saying, you know, Jewish bankers, right? That even if you're not saying, oh, the Jewish bankers are the problem, but you're saying the bankers, these specific people, are the problem, rather than saying capitalism is the problem, rather than saying, you know, this set of relations is the problem, that you're still engaging in fundamentally the same structure of activity that anti-Semitic groups or, or, you know, other white supremacists are engaging in. And for me, the, uh, our adversary is not specific people whom we hope to conquer and dominate. Our adversary is the social relations that enable some people to conquer and dominate others. And I feel like we have to be really clear about the distinction between this. You know, ultimately, to get conceptual, our enemy is enmity. But we have to, you know, we have to fight these institutions, these relations, you know, as, as they are like represented and imposed and defended by specific people, of course. That's why, you know, when, when a line of police charges you and there's a specific police officer coming at you, you have to engage in a conflict with that police officer. But the goal of that should not be that you then become the person who is dominating that other person. The, the goal should be to make it impossible for anyone to carry out that kind of domination or ultimately to draw the loyalty or at least the mercenary attitude that causes people to become police officers in the first place. Everybody who is the beneficiary of an oppressive system today, when they hear us speaking this way about, you know, destroying the institutions that they benefit from, that makes them more likely to identify with the institutions for the most part, right? They're like, okay, we have to defend ourselves from these fucking anarchists who want to kill us. At the moment at which it's possible for there to be a mutiny, uh, which is the, the starting point usually for a revolution, is when some people mutiny, when some people reject their role in the existing order. At that moment, the people who engage in that mutiny recognize that they have more to gain from fighting against the institutions than from being afraid of us. And, and so I, I think it's actually in our interest as revolutionaries to always convey to people that we're not fighting against them personally. We don't desire to exterminate them. We actually are, are proposing a different set of relations that would be more fulfilling for them as well. You know, that it's actually more fulfilling to be in nourishing, loving, mutually grounded relations with other people who are your equals than it is to own a billion dollars worth of assets. This does go against uh, one sort of strategy that is maybe summed up by the quote, like the people are killing the planet and they have names and addresses. That's another kind of thing that people say, right? Say with the shack case or something like that, where uh -huh. individuals are kind of targeted because corporations are so nebulous and so difficult to push back against. Well, I'm definitely, I'm not arguing against the tactics that were used in the shack campaign. To be clear, I'm arguing more that if it's necessary to engage in tactics like that, we should be very careful that we keep our real goals in mind as we employ them. That we don't fall into the sort of mental shorthand of thinking that if we can just get rid of the bad people, that that will take care of everything. That's what I'm arguing. It's not an argument against any particular tactics. There may even 
at some point in history have been a time when guillotines were used for good, although in all my research I was never able to come up with one. Yeah, but the, the point really is that what, what guides us is, is essential there. You know, the, the, the earth is being killed, and the people who are doing it do have names and addresses, and we have to make it impossible for them to do that, take that as it will. But the thing that will ultimately make it impossible for anyone to do that is to give everyone a sense of their shared interest in making that impossible. You know, anarchism proposes a completely horizontal distribution of power. And how would we maintain that? Well, it would take a lot of people understanding the value of the horizontal distribution of power to prevent anyone from amassing and concentrating it so as to dominate others. And just to kind of drive that point home, can you discuss a few of the people that you did discover lost their lives at the guillotine? Oh, goodness. I mean, that is one of the things that that makes the guillotine memes so ironic for revolutionaries, you know, is just that so many people that, that we, like, admire or look up to or at least remember as part of our movements were, were killed by guillotines, you know. The famous anarchists, you know, from a hundred years ago from the propaganda of the deed era, like Emile Henri or Sante Casario, uh, Auguste Vaillant, Rav- Ravachol, uh, the whole Bono gang, all of those people were guillotined, you know. The, the people from the White Rose, the anti-Nazi youth organization in Munich, uh, you know, in 1942, 1943, they were guillotined. The, the Nazis actually guillotined about the same number of people during their reign that, as the Jacobins guillotined during the time that they were in power. So the, the guillotine has a, has a like a really uh, rough history as a, as a particular tool that has almost always been used by people that we would not identify with against people who were courageous and generous in, in the things that they contributed to, to humanity. So when I first uh, reached out to you about this uh, interview, I, I mentioned one of the reasons that I wanted to talk about this on our show is the this kind of scandal that was created at uh, Queen's Park in Toronto on May Day where um, it was some kind of anarchist and anti-fascist mix of people brought a replica guillotine to Queen's Park, which is where the uh, government of Ontario sits, and kind of made the dual point about uh, sort of austerity and cuts uh, as well as sort of this guillotine gesture towards political violence. Um, what, uh, what would you say to somebody who participated in in making that happen oh i mean just that we're part of the same movement with probably compatible goals and uh that this is you know this whole uh, reflection about guillotines is just the sort of comradely criticism and debate that we always hope to foster and that we think is one of the really strong points of the the anarchist movement historically is that it's a, a space of self-education and, and debate in which there are no dogmas and in which we are always trying to reevaluate the strategies and symbols that we use and being critical of ourselves and each other, but constructively, I hope. Yeah, and I, w- I will say it did uh, it did rile up the, <laughs> the intended targets quite a lot. Uh, the yeah. the government's uh, the Ford government spoke about it in in uh, the legislature and and tried to get a police investigation. Um, I'm wondering if there's another kind of another image that could have been used with more liberatory history that would that would also have that kind of effect because I think that was intended. That's a good question, and and that's a question for. Uh, aspiring anarchist historians, you know, it's it's our responsibility to unearth the the symbols and the gestures and the and the accomplishments of the people who came before us. You know, whether they were self-identified anarchists or others anywhere across the world fighting against colonialism and other forms of hierarchy. You know, to to keep those in our thoughts, to bring them back to life, and to invest them with revolutionary force. One of the tragedies of the 20th century is that after the Russian Revolution, so many people who had been anarchists became state communists, 
because it seemed to be successful. And now, a hundred years later, the reference points that we have for struggle against the state are largely statist reference points. You know? and, and it would really behoove us to popularize other images because imagery has power. The, the image of the black bloc smashing the windows of Starbucks in 1999 you know, during the World Trade Organization summit in Seattle you know, was extremely important for catalyzing a generation. You know, the image of the Zapatistas uh, taking power in Chiapas had done the same thing a few years earlier. Uh, if the iconography that we act under, if the banners that we like put at the front of our, our marches direct, uh, you know, everyone's, like, fantasies to, to, like, incorporate this authoritarian history of revolutionary struggle, we can be sure that we will have the same problems again. This idea of the revenge fantasy um, is identified as, a, as an understandable desire by people who are oppressed and dominated. Um, but there's this distinction between desire and, and a politics of liberation. And oh. I'm just trying to trying to figure out what is being said about what is this relationship between people's desires and, and people's politics. Cause I think this is an off debated sort of binary in our, in our scenes here. Huh. That this is a super interesting question, right? I mean, and I, I felt like you were. I felt like when you identify that in our discussions leading up to this interview as a tension within different crime think texts, I thought that was really smart. Um, so there's a question about what the role of desire should be in revolutionary politics. There's a, a couple frameworks for how we understand desire that we probably shouldn't uh, emulate, you know, one is the sort of vulgar populism, which is like, whatever people want, let's make sure they get it. If everybody wants a widescreen television, then our job is to carry out like a, a class war in which we secure a widescreen TV for everybody, you know? Um, another idea about how we should relate to desire is the sort of ascetic militancy where you prove that you are more militant than the next person by being willing to give up on things. I feel like the sort of atmosphere of anarchist and generally left organizing in the last quarter century has really shifted from having this sort of optimistic, desire-based approach to, to this sort of hostility to desire and just mutual suspicion, everyone thinking that, you know, that everybody else's desires are a problem and that the most important thing is to impose a notion of duty, you know, which we are just now finally starting to see some pushback against that from people like Sadia Hartman, you know, who, who recognize that that militant asceticism is actually not going to, it's not a, a, a star that we can follow to a, a world in which everyone will be free or happy or white supremacy will be abolished, you know. If we understand desire as political, what does that mean, you know? The first thing I would say is that Certainly, we can't, we can't pursue a politics that is about suppressing or refusing desire. But also, desire doesn't. What the things that we desire don't always tell us everything that we need to know about what would, what it would take for us to actually be happy. I think desire usually tells us more about where we are than about where we should be, in the sense that you know, if you talk to a person from a city. You know, they're like, and you're like, what do you want, city person? You know, they, they say, they usually say something like, well, what I really want to be able to do is retire to the country. Now, your average city dweller would be really bored in the country. But they fantasize about living in the country because that, is, that desire is produced by the stresses of city life. It doesn't mean that they'd be happy in the country, but it does tell you what the problems are with being in the city. You know, in, the sense, in this sense, like, Foucault says that uh, pleasure is, can be more transformative than desire. Desire is produced by, like, our experiences in the past, but pleasure can surprise us. Pleasure can, like, take us by surprise and introduce us to new desires that we didn't have before. 
For, for me, the interesting thing about understanding desire politically, I mean, desire is what causes us to produce the world we live in and to, to reproduce this world. This world reproduces desires that keep us in it. If we think about desire politically, we're thinking about how to create situations that produce other desires that would, in, that make, it, that would make it possible for us to want things that would lead us to another world. And that, I think that's fundamentally the the anarchist question. You know, at 20 years ago, there were people talking about this in a way that sort of got misunderstood or reduced to consumer politics. So, you know, veganism, for me, the thing that was interesting about veganism is not just that you'd be, you know, putting your money elsewhere so that you're reproducing sort of a soy monocrops rather than uh, the cattle industry in what used to be the Amazon rainforest, you know. But, but the, the thing that's interesting about veganism is people intentionally shifting their tastes, intentionally shifting their desires. You know, and we can see this in a feminist framework also, that the things that we want right now might actually be destructive to the people that we love, but through like a process of experimentation and, and developing like positive desires experimentally, you know, through, like I was saying about Foucault and pleasure, through discovering new things that could be more fulfilling than the things that we currently do and, and want to do, that, that we could arrive at a, a place in which our social relations and the things we want could be more integrated and more mutually beneficial. So to bring that back to the, the guillotine, I totally understand why people would want revenge. I want revenge but I also want to arrive at a world in which nobody would be motivated by revenge, in which no one would even have cause to want revenge. So when we engage in social change, we can't think of it as a sort of a Hatfields and McCoys thing. You know, I understand why people want revenge. I want revenge. But our, our political actions should convey us beyond the world that we live in today and the desires it produces. I think there's also something going on about... Um, the impoverishment of uh, our imaginations, where we totally. where we we move to desire, or the only thing we we're left sort of able to desire are are basically more power, um, revenge, these kinds of things that I think sit in for our inability to imagine a, a life more worth living than what we have. Absolutely, if you believe that you could have a if you believe that you could have a truly fulfilling and beautiful life, including beautiful and fulfilling relations with the people you currently want revenge on, that would probably be more desirable. But right now we want revenge because we can't possibly imagine that. And, and becoming capable of imagining it, not in some sort of like superficial hippie way that would like give us an excuse not to take action, but becoming capable of imagining it in a way that would mobilize to take action, you know, with everything on the table to transform our relationships. I think for me, that's essential. It has to be what we're trying to do. Yeah. And I feel like I, I do know so many people who, um, can't imagine a better world right now. They just don't, they just don't have that in them. And, uh, and they do feel more empowered by, by letting that go. But I, I think on a, on a strategic level, it's, it's a huge sort of, loss for us to give up on uh on imagining better worlds for everyone yeah i mean th there's another way to come at that which is that it may be true that there's no future you know it, it may be true i mean on, on a long enough time frame we'll all be dead and the earth will be eaten by the sun Th those things are certain you know global climate change may also kill us off along with all the other species that are being destroyed all of those things are true. For me, that doesn't make it any less beautiful to take action in the present. And, and it doesn't make it any less meaningful. Because the present does exist. The present is real no matter what will happen in the future. If in the present we don't act in pursuit of the things that we consider meaningful and beautiful, that makes the tragedy that's underway a, uh, like a, like a farce, you know, it makes it, it makes it a travesty. It makes it 
ridiculous. It makes it, the whole situation just sort of embarrassing for us, you know, because then we're not losing anything anyway. But, but if we act showing that there could be another world, at the least, it, it gives the tragedy that we're enmeshed in, like, weight, and it, and, and it means that there will have been something beautiful in the world when it comes to an end. And I think that rather than having this like long view of history where we're like, well, in the end we'll be defeated, in the end there'll be nothing, we have to return to the present moment and become capable of acting in the context that we're in, you know, but like guided as if like navigating by the stars by a vision of the best thing that our lives could be. Because ultimately we don't know what the future will hold and it could hold beautiful things. I'm just wondering what uh, what is giving you optimism and hope right now? Like what what's going on around the world that that you find personally inspiring at this time? Oh, that's a that's a good question. Hmm. I mean, for me, the fact that people are still struggling at this point, you know, after all the defeats of the 19th century and 20th century, after all of the people who were removed from from history by guillotines, capital punishment, firing squads, you know, uh, all of those things give me, give me hope. You know, I, I remember being in Berlin, uh, at the end of the 20th century at Kopi, which is like a, one of the famous like squatted social centers there and being in a room with, you know, a few hundred people in it, like punks, anarchists, aspiring revolutionaries. And it coming home to me that half a century before in Berlin, everyone like that had been killed. Everyone with any like dream of liberation ha- had been had been killed, you know, into the millions, right? Like a huge number of people. And that despite that, the the children of of that generation were still able to to reinvent anew fr- from nothing the, the dream of liberation and revolutionary social change. You know, for me, that, that like reminder that, that you can't uh, guillotine away, that you can't execute away the, the, the part of the human heart that like longs for freedom and for some sort of meaningful togetherness, that, that always guides, guides me, you know. Um, as for struggles today, it, it, it helps to be connected to people who are struggling against Bolsonaro in Brazil or people in, in Russia under the terrible conditions that prevail there now who are still trying to do solidarity with all the different people targeted with the, like, the, like, torture cases there, you know. I mean, the, the fact that people have not given up, uh, that, that gives me hope. And then on the other side... The, the certainty, which is increasingly clear for all to see that the prevailing order cannot go on indefinitely, uh, that just underscores how urgent it is that we be seriously taking action in such a way that, that, that we will be prepared to make sure that what comes after it is not worse. That's all we have for today. If you'd like to find more Crime Think stuff, you can always go to their website, crimethink.com, which is spelled C-R-I-M-E-T-H-I-N-C dot com. As always, we love to hear feedback from you, so you can send us an email at fromembers at riseup.net. Otherwise, we'll see you next Wednesday at 8 o'clock on CFRC 101.9 FM, or anytime you like on your podcast app. Have a good night. Lavoratori a voi Diretto il canto Di questa mia canzone Che sa di pianto E che ricorda un baldo Giovin forte Che per amor di voi Sfidò la morte A te caserio ardea Nella pupilla
stelle vendette umane la scintilla e dalla plebe che lavora e geme donasti ogni tuo affetto ogni tua speme eri nello splendore della vita e non vedesti che notte infinita la notte dei dolori e della fame che incombe sull'immenso uman carname e ti levasti in atto di dolore di ignoti strazi al tier vendicatore e t'avventasti tu si buono e mite a scuoter l'alme stanche ed avvilite tremarono i potenti all'atto fiero e nuove insidie tesero al pensiero ma il popolo a cui tutto donasti non ti comprese pur tu non piegasti e i tuoi vent'anni una feral mattina donasti al mondo da la ghigliottina al mondo di la tua grande alma pia alto gridando viva l'anarchia dormi caserio entro la fredda terra donde ruggire udrai la final guerra The border is not just a wall. It's not just a line on a map. It's a power structure, a system of control. The border does not divide one world from another. There is only one world, and the border is tearing it apart. The X Worker Podcast presents No Wall They Can Build, a guide to borders and migration across North America. A serialized audiobook in 11 chapters released every Wednesday. Tune in at crimethink.com slash podcast.